Happy Thanksgiving week, folks, and welcome back to Hashtag Ask GSM, episode 365 for November 25th, 2020. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. And if you're outside of the United States, hope you're having a great week nonetheless. Um, I know something that everyone can look forward to, and that's Christmas, coming up in exactly one month from today. And I said this last week in response to Brandon's question, and Brandon's back with another question this week. Um, but he basically asked me, is it okay to start celebrating Christmas now, given everything that's going on in the world at the moment? And I said, absolutely. Although Thanksgiving isn't until tomorrow, and I'm pretty lenient around you know this week of the year anyway, um, it's usually around October, early November that I'm like, okay, Let's stop celebrating so early, but given the circumstances right now in 2020, I am willing to forgive anyone that wants to start celebrating Christmas early, um, even if it includes a day before Thanksgiving. And again, if you're even outside of the country, it doesn't even matter anyway. I hope you're having a great week nonetheless, as I said before. But if you want to send in a question to the show, be sure to tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with a hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, Facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop your question on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Uh, first, we start off with No Laura from Facebook. Do you see Anna J being AEW Women's Champion, or is it too soon for her? Definitely too soon. I've liked what I've seen from Anna J. She has a good look. She has potential in the ring. She is far from being there quite yet. I know, you know, she didn't need new opponents. She's already beaten Big Swole, Thunder Rosa, uh, Nyla Rose. They need some real feuds in that division. They have Baker and Rosa, which isn't for a championship, but that's a great feud nonetheless to have in that women's division. Sheeta needs real competition. Giving yet another championship to the Dark Order, while I like the Dark Order, is not the answer. It doesn't help Anna Jay. It doesn't help Sheeta. It doesn't help the division. She's not quite there yet. She may go in there and have a breakout showing, a lot like Penelope Ford did over the summer at Fighter Fest, and I'm hoping that happens. But the bottom line is that I, that she shouldn't, and I don't expect her to walk out as the new women's champion tonight. It's way too soon, as you said. Uh, Brandon A. has got a bit of a lengthy question here, or I think two questions. Um, nonetheless, they, they start off with, What's up, GSM? Happy Thanksgiving and wishing you, Alexis, and your family stay safe while still enjoying yourselves over the holiday. I appreciate that, brother. Um, his first question, I believe, mm, yeah, no, I think it's his only question for this week, but his question was, and it's a lengthy one, but it's a good one. He says, I like Sheeta. I like Thunder Rosa. I like a number of other women's wrestling on Dynamite. I believe it's still, um, I believe it's because many of, um, many of them are good at wrestling. I also believe it is because I'm a pretty nice guy and I, in general, root for pro wrestlers to succeed, including the women and people on the undercard. But from a character storytelling or TV standpoint, why should I care about any woman on the AEW roster outside of Britt Baker and Big Swole? The character work and the effort put into stories for the women have been abysmal. Let's take a look at someone like Nikki Bella during their last full-time run. During her last full-time run. Hardcore wrestling fans hate her. Yet, she had three great feuds in a row on SmackDown in 2017 with Carmella, Natalia, and Maurice. Everyone was invested, and the matches were decent to good, even though Nikki, Carmella, and Maurice aren't known for their ring work. People love Sheeta and Rosa for their ring work, but not Natalia. How does this make sense? Is it because they are new, Sheeta and Rosa? If that's the case, why are people enjoying Serena Deep so much? Is there bias? Is there a bias when it comes to AEW women because they seem to get a pass on things that WWE women or creative don't get a pass on? We at least, um, some sort of of story, I'm not, I think, you, I think I excluded the word there, I think you uh, missed the word, but we expect, um, I think, at least some sort of a story when watching a women's match in WWE, even if it's someone with like, even if it's with someone like Lana, I have a much clearer perspective on Lana's character, goals, and motivations than I do with her Kurashida, and that just shouldn't be. Brett Baker, The Bunny, Brandy Rhodes, Jade, and Nyla all have more going on story-wise right now than most of the rest of the roster in their entire AEW histories. They need writers now, otherwise why should I care? To be clear, I really do like Sheeta and Rosa and the rest of the women. I know I sound negative towards them. So again, a loaded question here. You made a number of points, some of which I agree with, some of which I do not. The ones I agree with, Nikki Bella, I completely agree with, had a great run in 2016-2017. Something I never thought I would say because I did not give two fucks about the Bella Twins. 
for most of their careers. They definitely improved Nikki more than Bray. Nikki had a pretty decent Divas Championship run. Um, it wasn't my favorite. She faced a lot of the same people. That's not really her fault. But when she came back from the injury in 2016 after about a year off, it, she obviously, I'm not going to say it wasn't, you know, to her credit, because it absolutely was. The division at that point, the SmackDown Women's Division, had like six people. It kind of reminds me of the SmackDown Women's Division now. Um, not, you know, it's not the same thing at all. But like now we have Sasha as the champion. She still has an underlying feud there with Bailey if they want to go back to it. She's feuding with Carmella. They have Bianca on the show. She's someone to watch out for. They just debuted Chelsea Green. At least they seem to have more going on, and Natalia kind of has her story, even though I don't really give a shit about Natalia. There seems to be more going on with that division compared to the Raw Women's division. Like Asuka, for example. She has absolutely nothing going on. Why should I care about Asuka? I mean, you say this stuff about Rosa and Sheeta, and I completely agree, but why should I care about Asuka? Why should I care about Shayna Baszler? I like these women a lot. But there's nothing really going on there. Storyline-wise, I guess they're telling a story right now with Lana. The issue with Lana, just because they have some sort of a story doesn't make it a good story. You know, I think some people have their preference whether they prefer a good wrestler over a good storyteller, and some women can do both. With Sheeta, we don't really know a lot about her, but she connects with fans. She is really good. She is the complete package aside from the fact that we never really hear from her. And I think the biggest difference between her and Riho, who we also never heard from, maybe they don't speak English well. I mean, actually, she, I think, from what I've heard, speaks pretty decent English. A lot better than Riho. Riho was barely on the show. They, they literally went two months without featuring their women's champion last year. That made absolutely no sense to me. Thunder Rosa, we've gotten a bit of a better idea of who she is, what she's about from the video packages and the promos that they've done with her. So I disagree on Rosa. Shida, we don't know a ton about. She really isn't on TV consistently enough. The NWA Women's title feels more important than the AEW, AEW Women's Championship. Now, I know the NWA World Women's title has been around longer than the AEW Women's Championship, but in terms of how it's portrayed on the show, it, it feels more important from that respect as well, which should not be the case for their own Women's Championship. So yeah, Nikki Bella had a great run in 2016, 2017, great stories, and the matches were very good. That was a nice balance, where it was like the feuds worked, and the matches were also good. You talk about Natalia. I'm a big... Yeah, I, Brandon, you probably know, a lot of people probably know who listen to the show. I could not give two shits about Natalia, And I've said this many, many times before. You can't even compare the two. Sheeta, Natalia, and Rosa... Natalia doesn't even come close. I think, and I said this on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, Natalia, while she is good, I think a lot of people overrate Natalia. She and I have seen great matches from. And I was the first one, when the AEW women's division launched, I was the first one to say this Joshi women's stuff. It's not that I don't like Japanese women's wrestling, but they were putting these women on the show. I just didn't get two fucks about them. I said the exact same thing a year ago when they were doing Riho versus Ima Sakura. Why the fuck should I care? I mean, honestly, just because they, just because they're, you know, acclaimed women's wrestlers from over in Japan, why should I care? I didn't care about Riho. I didn't care about Ima Sakura. They've done a better job with Cheetah. Of, I mean, she needs to cut more promos. But early on, they were doing a better job of her. They were giving her more video package time. Rosa, again, I don't really agree with Rosa and how you kind of view her because she has cut a lot more promos. She's not even signed with them. She's not even signed with them. She also has a lot of goodwill built up over in NWA. So the people that are fans of her kind of know her history from that company and when she was cutting promos and whatever. Listen, dude, I'm the first one to agree on the fact that a lot of these women don't have stories going on. Brandy Rhodes is just fucking terrible. The bunny sucks. Allie has regressed in the ring since coming to the company. Britt Baker gets promo time almost every single week. So I don't know where you're coming out with her, like, oh, you know, storyline-wise, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you did say that she, the bunny, Brandy Rhodes have more storyline-wise going on than... um than Cheetah and, and Rosa. Rosa has a feud going on now with Baker that just started a week ago. Jade just showed up a, a, a week ago. Just because they have stories doesn't mean they're they're set. The stories suck. Nyla Rose and the Vicky thing, the Vicky Rose, <laughs> the Vicky Rose, the Vicky Guerrero and Nyla Rose pairing fucking sucks. It serves no purpose. I don't care. Nyla has improved in the ring, though. The Bunny, I just don't give a shit about the Bunny at all. The Brandy Rose anna Jay storyline, just because it's a storyline doesn't make it good. The storyline sucks. Natalia is not very good. 
Going back to Natalia for a moment, she came up at a time where the women's wrestling was so fucking bad that I think people overrate her a little bit too much. Beth Phoenix, I would say, while not one of the greatest women's wrestlers of all time, was definitely better than Natalia. I have not seen an above-average match with Natalia in years. Oh, the Charlotte match from TakeOver. Dude, that was six years ago. And also at a time where the women's wrestling sucked. I have seen 15 better matches than Charlotte and Natalia in the last six years. It was just good for the time. There's a lot of matches that were great for the time. Ricky Steamboat and Randy Savage, it's not overrated, but if it happened in 2020, it wouldn't be the same thing because we weren't getting that type of wrestling on the regular back in 1987, which is why that match stood out so well. And also, those two were just amazing anyway. Natalia, she just hasn't really evolved at all. I know nothing about her character. Again, I think she's a terrible example of what you're going for here. At least people like Bailey has evolved. I could see something like with her... You talk about how people don't like Natalia. It, it's justified, though. She has no character. I don't give a shit about her. Her matches aren't that good. She comes across as almost intolerable, either as a babyface, heel, tweener, whatever. She's been doing the same shit for a decade now. She never takes time off. She's always there. She's faced everyone ten times over. There is literally nothing exciting about Natalia. I kind of sort of like the back and forth that she had with Bailey on Talking Smack last week. Other than that, I cannot point you to a single thing that has been, that I would consider must-see or great or very good in the last couple of years. Promo-wise, match-wise, character-wise, the Nikki Bella thing was good, that's about it. In recent years, I mean, I can, I mean, Sheeta has done more in the ring than Natalia in the last 365 days. And I know it's not all about ring stuff, but when you compare the two, it's not even close. You mentioned Big Swole and Big, uh, uh, Britt Baker. In terms of women, why should you care about them? I, I don't give a shit about Big Swole. I don't really think she's all that good. Um, the character, I know she had, I think, a rough upbringing. She mentioned it in one of those, like, undesirable to undeniable video packages on Dark like a year ago. But I've known nothing about her since. She did have a story going with Britt Baker. But I just, I don't know. I just, she, Big Swole just does nothing for me. Um, but they do have a lot of good women, though. The women's division in AEW is not great overall. It's abysmal. They won't feature their women's champion enough, but they'll put, you know, what was it, Ty Conti and Red Velvet on the show? It wasn't very good. The matches aren't very good. Sheeta will come through with a great match, or Rosa will come through with a great match. Rosa, indeed, went in there and had one of the best women's matches so far in AEW. So you wonder why they care about uh, Serena Deeb. That's why. We need to hear more from her. She should cut more promos. We should get to know more about her. And also a lot more people know her from her time in WWE. And know her story. So it's not like she's this random women's wrestler that came on the scene. That has no prior, you know, prior established experience. Sheeta didn't. But she came in and connected with the crowd. And she's had really, really good matches. And she's probably the best that they have right now. They should be doing more with her. They could be doing more with her. They probably will do more with her hopefully soon. Their women's division is a big you know, issue overall. But I completely disagree that the... No, no. When you, you can't even compare Natalia to, to, to Sheeta and Rosa. And yes, a part of it is the fact that they're new. Natalia's been around for a dozen years with almost no time off and has been facing the same people. And she's just, again, she's a little overrated. She is. She's good and she has a lot of experience. But I would, I mean, Sasha is better than her. Bailey is better than her. Charlotte is better than her. Asuka is better than her. Um, Becky's obviously better than her. There's so many more women on that roster that are better than her in almost every way. To the point where she's not even close to being the best anymore. And I've said that before. Dolph Ziggler's in a very similar spot. Where Dolph Ziggler, 10 years ago, was the best of a of a certain crop. Because they didn't have a lot of great wrestlers like him. Nowadays, they have so many great wrestlers to the point where he just kind of falls you know, in, in the pecking order a little bit. He gets lost in the shuffle. Because he's not nearly as good as these other guys. So anyway, their women's division needs a lot of help, but I think Sheeta and Rosa, while they could be doing more with them, are in a far better position than Natalia. If they don't make much progression in the next five to ten years, then we have a problem. But Natalia's been around forever, to the point where there's reason why wrestlers leave and go and come and go and go to different promotions, go to different territories, because they get stale after a while. Natalia's been stale for at least five to seven years. At least. At least. To the point where I just almost a channel changer whenever she comes on the show. At least with Rosa and Sheeta, I can expect a great match from them. 
and I know we're going to get something special anytime they step in the ring. Although their characters still have yet to be fully fleshed out. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine. Check out his show, Real Honesty with John Ritland. He did a great review. He did a great review last night of AEW Dark. Uh, be sure to check that out. We completely agree and uh, about Dark being three hours. He actually asked a question about that, so I'll save my thoughts on that for a little later on. His first question, though. Um, Asuka and Lana are going to win the women's tag team titles, aren't they? That was his question. I really fucking hope not. I mean, that women's division, that women's tag team division specifically, is just so pointless to the point now where they're putting teams together just to kind of fill the void because they lost a lot of teams over the summer. They lost Banks and Bailey. They lost the Iconics. They lost Mandy and Sonya. So now they're scrambling to put teams together. Nia Jax and Shayna are a makeshift tag team. Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke are a makeshift tag team. Lacey Evans and Peyton Royce, if you can even call them a tag team, are a makeshift tag team. And now Asuka and Lana are as well. Asuka should be doing far more than focusing on the fucking tag titles. If they want to do a tag title match on Raw, cute. But I have no desire to see, like, Asuka two belts. We've, we've done the two belt shit before. Leave the tag team division to itself. I would just get rid of it entirely. It's, it's such a waste of time and just a, such a waste of titles, honestly. The titles mean nothing. Banks and Bailey did their best with them. But that's because they are important characters. Nia Jax is fucking terrible, and she's not interesting, she's not exciting. Shane is very good, but the pairing with Nia is not. They're just wasting her. They could be doing Asuka and Shayna right now for the Raw Women's Championship. Why aren't we getting that? Why are they focusing too much time on the Lana thing right now? It's not working. If there were fans there, I guarantee you, they would not have had this raucous reaction to Lana being the sole survivor. They would have been pissed that Bianca Belair got counted out. I can almost guarantee you. The only time that Lana ever really came close to getting popular with the audience was when she was with Rusev five, six years ago, and they were chanting, We Want Lana. Other than that, she has been a, just a complete bust. In the ring, as a manager, she's good, but the best person that she could have been with was her own husband. And then they fired him. I don't know. I just don't understand the whole Lana push. They're trying to make her out to be a baby face. I just don't think it's working. She had that great con uh, chronicle on the network over the weekend. And it did make me feel bad for her, but we don't see that shit on the show. It's not like she had this miraculous performance on Sunday. She literally won just by standing there. It was an actual joke. It made me laugh, but it didn't make me care about Lana. It just, it's just not good. So I really hope they don't win the tag titles. Keep that shit away from Asuka. She's already held it, what, once before with, uh, with Kyrie saying, we don't need to see Asuka and Lana as the tag team champions. Could it happen? Very possible. Um, Sheena and... Um, now nah, you've already beaten pretty much everyone else. Why are, like, Peyton Royce and Lacey Evans a tag team? They just broke up the Iconics. Why is Peyton in another tag team? Because they need more teams? If you need to start doing that type of shit, you probably should just disband the entire division. John's next question. Who would you say are the three to five WWE and AEW talents that have stepped up and made the best of the pandemic era? Um, That's a great question. So there's a lot of people I would say. The Hurt Business has been a recurring highlight on Raw. Um, in the last couple of months, I've really enjoyed the work from Bobby Lashley, uh, Shelton Benjamin, MVP being their manager, Cedric joining. They've been a recurring Raw highlight for a while now, so definitely them. I would say above anyone else, even over McIntyre, who I'd also put on that list because he's really, you know, even without fans, become a successful top star. And it's not like, oh, he's improving Raw ratings. It'll never get to that fucking point. It doesn't matter who they put the belt on. They could put the belt on CM Punk tomorrow. John Cena. CM Punk. It doesn't matter. Ratings will not autom automatically suddenly improve with someone being the champion. We passed that point a long time ago. You know, we can blame, like, I, I hated Jinder as the WWE champion, but I'm not going to blame the declining SmackDown ratings on him. It doesn't help. But it's not like if you put the belt on AJ for a year, which they did it's going to improve the ratings drastically because we're well past the point of any of that stuff really mattering. Um, in some cases, it does if they're telling a great story. But anyway, so McIntyre has been a great WWE champion. He's been one of the better parts of the Raw uh, of Raw in 2020, so I'd put him on that list. But even more so than McIntyre, Sasha Banks and Bailey. For as overexposed as they were there for a while over the summer, you know, appearing on Raw and SmackDown and even at NXT almost three times a week, including pay-per-views, they were way overexposed. They had a great story. They've had a lot of great matches. They elevated that women's tag team division. Um, they've elevated the SmackDown Women's Championship. They've done a lot of great stuff together. So Sasha and Bailey, to me, have really been the MVPs of this pandemic era. I would put Asuka on the list, I, not for the reasons that people probably think, 
I've seen a lot of people say, ho, 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 Asuka on commentary. I mean, this is why she's the best of the pandemic era. Asuka on commentary fucking sucks. And I said this before, but the whole Asuka rambling Japanese promos are terrible. Because I guess in Vince's mind, what's intimidating is whenever she screams in Japanese. It's not intimidating. It's not funny. It's just dumb. It's just stupid. And it's not Asuka's fault. Like, she would cut promos before, and I think she cut a promo with Lana on Raw this week that I thought was fine. But, like, when she was in NXT, she wasn't screaming in Japanese every chance she got and acting all like a goof. The whole dancing moves thing, I think it's just stupid. And to me, it makes her out to be a joke. I don't take her seriously. But she has had a lot of good matches, and her feud with Bailey and Banks did help in terms of making her uh, a solidified star again. So I would put her on that list as well. And Roman Reigns, of course. Roman Reigns, um, over on SmackDown, has had a great 2020 in terms of coming back as a heel, winning the Universal Championship, the Jey Uso stuff. Jey Uso's also had a great... He's had a great last couple of months. So, um, yeah, Roman Reigns has also been an MVP for that company in 2020, at least the last couple of months. For AEW, um, a few different people. Ricky Starks has really stood out. He came in and you know, blew the roof off the place. He had a good match with Cody, but really since Team Taz, since he joined Team Taz, the guy's been killing it. He's been a great get for them. He's very good in the ring. I've enjoyed the Darby Allen feud. Ricky Starks is a star, and I'm very happy to see that more people are finally recognizing that and seeing that now that he's on a bigger platform. I mean, someone like John, actually, who asked this question, I think knew about Ricky Starks before anyone else, not like anybody, but he was familiar with him from, like, the championship wrestling from Hollywood promotion or the West Coast promotions and stuff like that. John, I believe, already knew who he was. I didn't really know who he was until NWA came around about a year ago, NWA Power, and that was when I was introduced to his work, and I really became a fan right from the get-go. So I'm glad he's really killing it right now, EW. Cody has been also a recurring highlight. You know, Regardless of how you feel about Cody, he's had a lot of good matches and programs this year. The um, AEW TNT Championship Open Challenge was a recurring highlight on Dynamite for a while there. And the Lance Archer match wasn't great. The MV, the MJF match wasn't great. Um, but he's had a lot of great matches on TV. So it's been cool to see Cody doing his thing. John Silver, I don't know if I would call him an MVP of the pandemic era on Dynamite. But, you know, he's gotten over, maybe not because of the pandemic. But it also begs the question, if there were no fans, would John Silver still be getting over the same... If there were fans, rather, would they still be doing the same segments on Being the Elite that they have that have endeared John Silver to the audience. I'm not sure. I, I don't know, probably, but I don't know. But John Silver has been a lot of fun to watch on that show. Again, not so much in Dynamite or Dark, but they are giving him more TV time. He is getting more over, I feel. And I, I like John Silver, so he's been one of the MVPs, I feel. You know, FTR came in. They've had a lot of good matches, a lot of success. Um, won the tag team titles, held those for a brief bit. So they've been... Uh, Again, they haven't thrived without the fans. It would be better if there were fans there, but they have done very well for themselves, even without an audience. Um, Adam Page, you know, it's not like he's been the MVP of the pandemic era. He would have been doing fine with or without fans, but, you know, he's been a highlight. Jericho kind of feels like he's taken the turn for the worse. And the entire inner circle, for that matter, is kind of taking the turn for the worse. Uh, I'm just not a fan of what they're doing right now. MGF's a recurring highlight. Darby Allen's always very good. There's a lot of people on Dynamite I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this year. So, uh, yeah, all, all props to all those people for making the most of the current circumstances and making these shows better than they had any right to be in 2020 without an audience. Um, his next question, what are the chances that both Raw and SmackDown get anywhere close to that same type of TV money in 2023 that they got in 2019? That's a great question. Um, probably not. I mean, this company, WWE, never ceases to amaze me. So maybe they'll find a way to kind of swindle the companies, the networks, or pull a fast one on them. I don't know. Or find a way to convince them, hey, our ratings aren't that bad, you know, compared to some other shows on your network. Specifically, you know, with Raw and USA Network, I'm pretty sure NBC, or not NBC, Fox has better shows on their network than SmackDown. But SmackDown has done fairly well for them, probably not the numbers they were hoping for, but the ratings haven't declined drastically. Raw's numbers are not great at all. They can barely even get 2 million fans a week now, which is pretty sad. Um, but that being said, you know, they, they still do better ratings, I believe, than any other show on that network. So for that reason alone, they might continue to make more money. In 2014, when all hope is lost, and they had to sign for lesser, I think, than they did previously, you know, five years later, what changed? How, how did Raw and SmackDown get those type of ratings, get those type of deals, 
with the way that the ratings were going from 2014 to 2019. It's not like the show's drastically improved. SmackDown for a bit did. But it's not like the show's drastically improved. And that's why they got this big TV money. So honestly, if the products were every bit as abysmal... I mean, SmackDown's decent right now, but anything can change in the next couple of years. If, if the products do not change at all, even if they get worse in the next four years, there's still a very good chance, with it being WWE that they could pull off a similar deal. I don't think they will. I think it's going to be a lesser deal. They got a lot of fucking money from both those deals. <laughs> they really, really did. Way more money than they probably should have. But props to them. And I think going forward, it's it's probably not going to be the same. It might go through a dip before going back up again. The company has these kind of periods where that happens. So I wouldn't be surprised if they sign for lesser money the next time and then for more money the time after that. But uh, we'll see. SmackDown might get booted off of Fox. Maybe not before then, but at some point, if they see the ratings aren't where they should be, even though the show's been doing well recently, then that's not good. They might get booted back to FS1 or back to USA. Who the hell knows? Um, but yeah, I think the odds of them going back to those same type of TV deals in four years from now, three, four years from now, eh, I wouldn't put my money on that. No, you know, No pun intended. His last question here. I know I've brought up some criticisms about Dark recently. But why was this week's show nearly three hours? I understand they want to feature more talents, but my God, for a B show, this is ridiculous. And I completely agree. Dude, there is absolutely no reason for fucking AEW Dark to be three hours long. I mean, come on, man. I put a whole tweet up about this last night. I talked about some people with it. I talked with some people about it. I mean, man, why did, I mean, I understand, oh, we got to feature as much talent as possible, then break the fucking show up into two different days. A three-hour show is such a complete waste of time. I'm not going to watch it in increments. I have to watch it with the first day or two that it comes out. Otherwise, I'm super behind. I'm not going to watch it piecemeal. I'd be done, I, I'd be done with the show in a month if I did that. It's not like any of the matches are worth going out of your way to watch anyway. Maybe one or two. I like that they're doing more talking segments recently. But bro, 17 matches is complete overkill. No one benefits from it. If you beat the same losers every single week, who really benefits? Yeah, some of these people are getting more reps, and I guess it kind of makes up for the fact they're not doing house shows and stuff like that. I mean, can they just go back to the formula they had before where they were doing, like, undercard feuds on the show, like three to four matches a show for only an hour? I mean, that made more sense. The show was way... I mean, it wasn't my favorite show on the, on the you know of the week. It wasn't my favorite wrestling show of the week, but it was at least bearable, and it made more sense than whatever the hell this is. 17 matches, if you even come close to defending that, you there's probably something wrong with you. I mean, honestly, these are the same people that would say, oh, fuck WrestleMania, how can it be 17, hours, 17 matches long? You're watching 17 hours, seven, I mean, it feels like 17 hours. You're watching 17 straight matches that have no story, complete squashes, and the outcomes are never really in doubt. People complain all the time about WWE. Oh, it's too predictable. The matches are all the same. Look at fucking Dark. I know it's not Dynamite, but Dark is the exact issue with what is wrong with wrestling. Way too long shows with pointless matches, and it's the same shit every fucking week. Listen, Raw is a shit show right now. I would take three, four to five hours of Raw compared to the three hours or whatever the fuck that was last night. Holy shit, they got a fucking panda on there, Nakazawa. I don't care if that's the minority. I don't care if that takes up 10 minutes of the show, of the three hours that it goes for. I had no desire to see a panda in the ring wrestling at all. Luchasaurus is one thing. I like Luchasaurus. He's not coming out in a dinosaur costume. He has a dinosaur mask. That's fine. That, that act works. Some guy coming out in a panda costume is just too dumb to take seriously. I'm sorry. At Iwagu91. How did you feel about Daniel Bryan announcing his retirement in 2016 and coming out of it two years later? I mean, we were all sad. I mean, I talked about it here at the time. I actually think I heard the news for the first time. RJ and I both, we were recording the show. I think we had like the day off or something from school. And we met up to record Hashtag. And we found out during the course of the episode while we were filming, and RJ can correct me if I'm wrong here, that Daniel Bryan was going to retire that night on Raw. And we were hoping it was a work. Obviously, it wasn't. It was super sad. I mean, it, it sucked because it, it felt like a Shawn Michaels type thing where he had he had to cut his career short. There were a lot more amazing matches to be had with him. He was only in the company for about five or six years at that point. 
there was still so much more for him to do aside from, you know, he already made event at WrestleMania, whatever championship there was to win, but there was still more for him to do. And it was really sad for him to cut his career short, but then he came back two years later. That was incredible. And um, he's been killing it ever since. Likewise, the second question, how did you feel about Paige announcing her retirement two years ago? Kind of the same thing, obviously, Paige has yet to come back to the ring, and I don't think she will. Um, but that was probably even more sad just because she's a lot younger than Daniel Bryan and she didn't even come close to reaching her full potential. Um, she won a lot of Divas titles. She was a relatively big star for them. Uh, she only won, I think, the Divas title twice, actually. Former NXT Women's Champion. She really could have been among those four horsemen like on that level in terms of being like one of those bigger women's wrestling stars. Injuries were her biggest uh, issue, I think. That's what really you know did her in. And then the neck injury, obviously, the ultimate neck injury that ended her career. Um, that really sucked. I was looking forward to seeing Paige and Asuka at some point. I think they were building to that when Paige first came back Came back with Absolution in late 2017. Um, it looked like they were building the Paige and Asuka, and I was hoping we would get that at WrestleMania, and then we got fucking... I don't know, was Asuka even on the show? Yeah, she faced, she faced Charlotte, which was cool, but I thought Paige and Asuka would have made more sense. But yeah, that sucked. That really sucked. And she was only, what, 20... Four years old? 26, maybe? I don't know how old she is now. I forget, but she is really, really young. And uh, it, it sucked to see her have to end her career so soon. Uh, what match do you think is The Undertaker's best one of his legendary career? Not really a bold opinion, but probably Shawn Michaels from WrestleMania 25. The only other match I'd probably put on that list in terms of like... I mean, obviously, there's a lot of great Undertaker matches. Obviously. But the only other match I would say that comes close to being his best is the other Shawn Michaels match. I mean, obviously, WrestleMania 26 too, but the Hell in a Cell match from Bad Blood 1997. That's the only other one. Um, there's a lot of other amazing Taker matches he's had. The matches with Batista. He had the great matches with Triple H in 2012 and 2011. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that Hell in a Cell end of an era match, even though it wasn't an end of an era. Um, the Punk match was good. I've enjoyed a lot of the Brock matches. The first Brock Cell match was great. The second one was also quite good. You know, he's the Kurt Angle match from No Way Out 2006 would also be on that list. Um, SummerSlam 98, him and Stone Cold had a very good match. Not great, but very good. There's, there's a lot of matches I'd put on there. But I think the best, and again, this is not a bold opinion at all, but him and Sean from WrestleMania 25. At noob underscore n underscore co 1991, what are your thoughts on Asuka and Lana teaming up together this week on Raw? Um, I already mentioned this, but it made sense with the story they're trying to tell. I just don't get the whole Lana babyface push at all. Um, Asuka feels like an afterthought. She had to roll up Shayna to beat her. Shayna's not credible at this point. She's one half of the tag team champions. I mean, that says something when she's one half of the tag team champions and she lacks credibility. She's a loser. Shayna Baszler is not going to be what she was in NXT. I've quickly come to that realization that they are not going to push her at the same level. And some people probably like that. They found her boring, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is that when she came to Raw, she felt like a star. They beat her. They beat her. They kept beating her. And now she's still getting beat. Even with the fucking title, she's still getting beat. I mean, come on, man. I, I don't know. I just don't care about the whole Lana storyline. And Asuka feels like she's kind of suffering from it. If Asuka goes heel, beats the shit out of Lana, then that's great. Probably not the best decision, though. Because if Charlotte comes back soon, which she probably will, then she's going to be a heel. You need a top face, and Asuka's that woman. Um, but it ain't going to be Lana, I'll tell you that much. At Jeremy81911, do you think they hold off on Drew McIntyre versus Sheamus for Royal Rumble? Yeah, I think they will, and they should. Um, it looks like the winner of next week's Triple Threat, they never said that the winner gets the title shot at TLC. So it makes me think they'll do the title match on Raw the next week, probably like McIntyre and Lee to kind of tie up that loose end from a couple of months ago, which I like. Have McIntyre probably face Strowman at TLC. I don't care about Strowman, but you know, it is a fresh match. It is. Um, we I think we may have seen it at least one other time, but it's not a feud we've seen before. So as a TLC main event or a TLC world title match, I'm fine with that. And then you can do Sheamus at the Royal Rumble. They shouldn't rush the Sheamus story anyway. They really should ease into it, have them team up a time or two, and then you have Sheamus turn on him because he's jealous of McIntyre being the champion. There's no reason to do it at TLC or anytime soon. I think the Rumble is the perfect time to do it. They could save it for WrestleMania. I just don't know if that's a world WrestleMania, like a world title WrestleMania worthy match. You know? Like, I don't see Sheamus winning the championship at WrestleMania. It's pretty obvious that McIntyre would win. And maybe they tell this amazing story and it is WrestleMania worthy. 
But for me, I don't know if that's the match they do at Mania. I don't think they will. I think they do it at the Rumble. That is the perfect Royal Rumble match. Jeremy's second question. After losing to Io Shirai, do you think Rhea Ripley is getting moved up to Raw or SmackDown? Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing else for her to do in NXT. She probably realistically could have been called up six months ago, and it would have been completely fun, and no one would have batted an eyelash. That Raw women's division specifically needs Rhea Ripley. SmackDown, I feel like they're okay, because they have Sasha and Bailey holding down the fort. Natalia's there to do jobs, but they also have Bianca on the way up. She's very good. Carmella just came, uh, just came back. They don't need another, like, oh, another star in the rise. Raw needs that right now. Lana sucks. Shayna feels like she's very damaged. I don't care about Nia. Charlotte's gone right now. Asuka's an afterthought. They need something fresh. They need something new. And they have a lot of other women they're not doing anything with right now. Naomi is still hurt. She'll be back at some point. Raw has a lot of women, so realistically, SmackDown could probably use Rhea Ripley more. And I wouldn't be mad if she goes there. But I just think Rhea and Asuka just makes too much sense to not do. And yeah, again, they could do Rhea and Sasha. But I feel like SmackDown women's division is fine. And they should be building the Bianca in, in Sasha at some point for that championship, and not Rhea and Sasha. I feel like Bianca and Sasha is the real money match there. Rhea can face Asuka, she can go to Raw, she can maybe feed with Lacey Evans for a little bit, Peyton Royce, um, and some of these other women before ultimately facing Asuka. And then you can also rekindle the rivalry, too, between her and Charlotte when Charlotte inevitably comes back. So, I think Raw is the right landing spot for her, but yeah, either way... It may not be in the next week. It may not even be until the Royal Rumble, a lot like Shayna Baszler. Um, she may continue to appear in NXT until they have a right plan, until they have a proper plan to call up Rhea Ripley with. But she's absolutely not long for NXT. She had the EO rematch. That's what we were all waiting for. She lost. She already feuded with everyone else. She already beat Raquel Gonzalez. Mercedes Martinez is reportedly coming back to NXT. She already beat her. Already feuded with, uh, you know, already faced Dakota Kai. She already feuded with, um, who else is in that division? Candice. Did they do Candice and Rhea? They may have done the match. I don't remember, but I guess they could do that feud. But Candice is already busy with Shotzi, so I don't see that happening. Yeah, I don't know. I just think, I think Rhea is absolutely main roster bound. I mean, she probably could have, re again, realistically could have been called up six months ago and it would, have been, it would have been completely fine. But at this point, I feel like she is more of a use to Raw than she would be in NXT. And yes, I realize the problems of calling people up and having them just get butchered, but it is better than her being in NXT forever, like a Gargano or a Velveteen Dream who kind of feels stale because they've been there for so long. At E13A from Twitter, with a legendary three-decade career seemingly done, how would you describe the lasting legacy of the Gooker? You thought he was going somewhere else there for a second. Um, the guy is the ultimate running joke. The biggest, one of the biggest disappointments in WWE history was that egg when it came out 30 years ago from last Sunday, when it ended up being a fucking turkey. They have brought it back many, many times. It was in the WrestleMania gimmick battle royal at WrestleMania 17. It was on the Raw Thanksgiving show back in 2009. It's, a, it, it's made several appearances on the show in the last 10 years. And it was at Survivor Series on Sunday, finally winning its first championship in the 24-7 title before losing it promptly, right back to R-Truth. Uh, I like the gooker. I like whenever it pops up every Thanksgiving season, and it was cool to see it celebrated its 30-year anniversary along with the, the other guy. What's his name? The Undertaker? I think that's what his name is. Um, on Sunday at Survivor Series. At E13A's second question, what do you make of Seth Rollins' run as the Messiah? And do you think the sacrifice at Survivor Series was meant to signal the beginning of the end for the character? I feel like the character's kind of polarizing in that some people really like it, and some people just don't care about it at all. I'm among those that enjoy the gimmick. I like the gimmick. I think it has potential. I think it's already done a lot of cool stuff. I think it was a necessary change for him because he couldn't kept, he couldn't keep doing what he was doing a year ago. He had to turn heel. The heel turn was the best thing for him. It was a fresh coat of paint for him, a new coat of paint. Um, and he was already kind of acting like a messiah anyway with how he kind of came across on Twitter and in his promos, the whole locker room leader, delusional gimmick. They worked perfectly. So I've enjoyed it. It's a little too over the top sometimes, and people might find it boring. The promos are not the greatest, but the Rey Mysterio feud really has just... It died a death a while ago, but he's had a lot of good matches with the gimmick. The feud of the Kevin Owens I thought was very good, and they had a very good WrestleMania match. So yeah, um, I just think with Rollins, 
He's successfully reinvented himself once again. He's a lot like Jericho, where the guy is the master of reinvention. He goes from the shield to authority, you know, like authority, uh, henchman, whatever, winning the championship, becoming t- uh, a world champion. The whole Kingslayer thing, when baby phase, redesign, rebuild, reclaim, um, how hot he was in 2018, reinventing himself again in the last year. I've thoroughly enjoyed Rollins' work in 2020. Not my MVP by any means, but I'm among those that has enjoyed the character, and when he comes back, I, I don't think it's the beginning of the end. He might be able to make some slight tweaks when he comes back, but I think the biggest issue with the character is that it works better when he has disciples. And, you know, Murphy was one. He had Austin Theory, and then he disappeared. And then AOP got fired. One of them got hurt, and then um, they just both got fired in September. So hopefully when he comes back, he either has another stable, does something completely new, and I think it's kind of it's better off at that point. But I wouldn't go back to being babyface Rollins, at least not right now. Dump down the road, absolutely. Especially when there's fans there. People are going to go crazy for him again at some point. But for now, I would ride this way for as long as you can. There's still a lot more mileage left, I would say. A lot more left in the tank with the Messiah character for Seth Rollins. At Scarlet 1, their final two questions here of the episode. Best and worst of the Wednesday Night Wars from last week. A lot of good. I really enjoyed NXT and Dynamite last week. Um, the best would be Io Shirai and Rhea Ripley. Fantastic match. Um, I enjoyed Young Bucks in Top Flight. Tony Storm and Ember Moon versus Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez was a very good women's match. The Undisputed Era return and subsequent War Games announcement, which aired after the show, actually, on the WWE YouTube channel. Um, That whole ending angle on NXT last week was great. I enjoyed uh, Cody Rhodes and Darby Allin versus Team Taz. I thought that tag team match was very good. And Serena D versus Thunder Rosa was a great NWA World Women's Championship match. Um, The only two things I didn't like from either show... It wasn't bad, but Orange Cassidy versus Kip Sabian, I just don't care. Orange Cassidy I like, but I don't know. Kip Sabian is just a, like a mid-carder for life. And they haven't really fleshed out his character a lot. Oh, he's a gamer. I mean, who fucking cares? I mean, I, I didn't really give a shit about the match. And then Dexter Loomis versus Cameron Grimes was even worse. Uh, they took the blindfolds off, which it was supposed to be a blindfold match. They took the blindfolds off almost immediately. There was a ref bump. They brawled at the back. There wasn't even a proper finish. It just ended without an ending, which was random. They just went to commercial break, and that was it. So I thought that was really, really stupid. Which is a shame, because they were coming off of what I thought a very entertaining Haunted House of Terror match at Halloween Havoc. And then this, it's just like night and day. And the feud isn't over, which is fine, but hopefully whatever match they have next is much better than whatever the hell we saw last Wednesday with them. And then the final question of the episode, Best and Worst of Survivor Series 2020. I thought it was a good show overall, far from a great show, um, just because the brand supremacy stuff just doesn't matter at all. I mean, then again, not, it didn't matter last year either, and that was a great show, I thought. Um, but this year's show, I mean, it, it was it was a good show. It wasn't a bad show. I thought it was a, um, a mild thumbs up. But the best of the show, I thought The Undertaker Farewell was very well done. Not for everybody. Some people might think, oh, it was disappointing, blah, 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 blah. He should have cut a better promo as himself, which I agree with, but... They might be saving that for another time. Probably his Hall of Fame induction. Inevitable Hall of Fame induction. But, um, yeah. So I didn't really have much of an issue with that. I thought the overall presentation of it was great. The best match of the show for me was Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre. I thought they fucking killed it. I thought Sasha and Asuka had a very good match. And Street Profits and New Day also killed it too. So I, I can't call it a bad show. I can't call it a subpar show. They had three terrific matches in a great retirement, quote-unquote, hopefully, for Undertaker at the end. The only two things I didn't really care about, the, the the men's elimination match was fine, the clean sweep for Raw over SmackDown, and blah, blah, blah. Didn't really do a lot for me, but it was it was what it was. The women's one was not very good at all. Um, Lana being the sole survivor, which was predictable, but it was a lame finish. Um, I just didn't really like the women's elimination match. Bailey getting eliminated like minutes in by Peyton Royce, who they clearly have no desire to push, by the way. It would be one thing if it was like Bianca. I'm sorry, Bianca was already on SmackDown. It'd be one thing if it was, like, someone that was on the way up. I mean, Peyton, Peyton Royce is on the way up, but they're not focusing on her right now, and they probably won't. So why waste that by having her get pinned within minutes by someone they don't give a shit about? That just made no sense to me. And then Sami Zayn and Bobby Lashley, I just didn't care. The match was well-wrestled, it was fine, but they were both heels. There was real no, no, no real build there. They were trading jabs back and forth on Twitter, but other than that, it was just really hard to care. I mean, honestly, the match was just kind of there. Lashley wins, as he should have, and that was it. But I thought it was a good show overall. 
And that's going to do it, guys, for episode 365. I mean, how did I not make that joke already? Holy shit. We are episode 365 of Hashtag Ask GSM. I said that at the very beginning, and I completely forgot. That is crazy. So we are going all the time here, 24-7, 365. Uh, we have not missed a week in a long time. I've been doing this show now for over seven years. We did the seven-year anniversary show live out here on YouTube back in July. Man, we... um. I stopped doing the show for a little bit when I first went to college in late 2013. So for about, I stopped in August, I rebooted it in July, or not July, I'm sorry, January. So I stopped doing it for like six months there, five to six months. Um, and then the only other time aside from that that I didn't do the show was like a three-week period in October of 2015 when my laptop shit the bed at college and I had no laptop. So I had to use this. I had the I had to use the uh, computers at school, and obviously I couldn't record on them. So I couldn't record hashtag for like three weeks. Now it sucked. So um, other than that, that was five years ago. I don't think I missed an episode of doing the show in over five years. Which and I'll pat myself on the back for that. I think that's pretty cool. You know, we we do the show on holidays. I've done it on Christmas before. I've done it on Halloween twice. Um, never on Thanksgiving, but just because it's never fallen on Thanksgiving, but. Any other holiday, you name it, I've probably done an episode of this show on that holiday. Um, maybe my birthday? I don't remember. Probably. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> we, we do it We do it every Monday and Wednesday. We did it on Mondays originally, and then I moved it to Wednesdays in 2016, which is just better for me. Um, but yeah, no, it's been a long time. 365 episodes in. That's a lot of episodes. So I appreciate you guys for checking out the show. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. We had my review of the Broken Skull Sessions with Stone Cold Steve Austin go up earlier, so be sure to check that out. And hit that bell button as well to be notified every time a new video goes up. So tomorrow we have WrestleRant Radio excerpts. On Friday I have my latest Uncool with Alexa Bliss review. And uh, Saturday, SmackDown review, Talking Smack review. There's a lot of stuff here on the channel. I've also had exclusive interviews with, as you guys have probably heard by now, um, Sasha Banks, Kevin Owens, Finn Balor, Jeff Hardy, Seth Rollins, Triple H, Johnny Gargano. We had um, Danny Burch a couple of weeks ago, Cameron Grimes, among other people. A lot of other exclusive interviews here on the channel. Paul Heyman. So check those out as well. And again, subscribe. You will never miss a video. We upload content every single day. You will never be bored. And it's a variety of content too. So send in questions, subscribe. And more importantly though, have a great Thanksgiving. If you live here in the country, in the United States, be sure to have a great holiday tomorrow. Um, I'm very thankful for you guys and the, and the support you show the show. So I very much appreciate that. Very thankful for everything else I have in my life. I'm very blessed. Very, very blessed. So... Have a great holiday. We will be back next week for our first episode in the month of December as the countdown of Christmas, for me anyway, begins. For a lot of other people, it started a long time ago in 2020 just because we need a holiday like Christmas right now to take our mind off of everything going on. Uh, so, yeah, just stay safe, guys. Take care. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm Graham Chiesa Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the turkey road.